We're going to be talking some about uh, the ultra poor graduation program that, that BRAC has developed and is being implemented now by many other organizations to to hear how this is a tool that reaches people in extreme poverty and provides pathways out of poverty for them. So I want to start with you, Shaman. Um, BRAC has had microfinance uh, as a core activity for many years. Why did you feel a need to start up a new program? Why did you feel the tool you already had wasn't going to work with this population? It's important to say that BRAC was doing work on uh, many in many sectors and through many interventions, right. not just microfinance. So, right, because you didn't start uh, as a microfinance. We didn't start as a microfinance institution, uh, but of course we were one of the early adopters of microfinance. Um, and uh, we'd been doing work for almost 30 years by the time we started thinking about the ultra poor as a separate segment that we wanted to do uh, targeted programming for. Um, I think the reason why uh, we looked at this was because after so many years of microfinance, um, we realized that uh, the microfinance program weren't really reaching the ultra poor. And by ultra poor, I don't mean the people, all the people below the extreme poverty line of $1.25 a day. It's, it's the people below half of that. So it's mm. people below 60 to 70, under 60 to 70 cents per day, mm. uh, which, is, uh, which is what the segment we call the ultra poor. Right. And in our experience, what we found was uh, microfinance A wasn't reaching the ultra poor and B there was a lot of self exclusion from microfinance by the ultra poor. So because we had the group selection yep. uh, methodology, the groups would leave these these uh, people, mostly women, out of the groups. Um, so that was part of the reason why we decided that um, we needed to look at the ultra poor separately, not from just a credit angle or just a credit and savings angle, and look at what are the interventions that we needed to combine together. Um, and, and do a sequenced sort of inter combination so, of interventions that can target the ultra poor. You saw these things. How did you figure out which order to put them in? So we had a fairly good understanding of the lives of, of the poor um, through, the, through the microfinance lens, through the health lens, through the education lens, through, the, through our work with agriculture and value chains. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we sort of uh, looked at what are the interventions they need and how would it make sense to sequence these interventions together. So the targeting is very important. The way we do it is through a participatory rural appraisal. So uh, it's basically a, a participatory wealth ranking system where the community comes together to find the poorest among them. Uh, the second critical element of the BRAC Ultra Poor program is the asset transfer. So uh, whereas a lot of similar programs do a cash transfer, a conditional cash transfer, we do a, a the, the sizable part of the intervention is an asset transfer. So it's a, it's, it's, it's a substantial asset and it's a so productive what, asset. What type of assets do you? Um, it could be um, from anything from um, poultry, um, cows to small petty trade. So it'll be things that we transfer. For and that. does the client have any choice in this? Do, do they choose what it is or do you The client it? does have choice in this and, and I mean the the BRAC staff and the clients will work together to find the best, okay. uh, the best enterprise for that client. Then we have the consumption stipend. Mm -hmm. uh, the stipend uh, in the BRAC program is, is fairly small. And the reason why the stipend is, gi is given or provided is because we want uh, the ultra poor households to be able to consume um, and have their normal ca calorie intake and not use the asset to sort of uh, not sell the asset for that. The other things, of course, we, we do very uh, intensive hands-on training. Uh, we provide healthcare support because health shocks, is, uh, health shocks are, a, are a big uh, reason for people backsliding mm -hmm. into ultra-poverty. Right. Um, and the last thing, and I would say very critical part of the BRAC model, is the social reintegration. So these are socially excluded, ostracized, typically women. Right, right. Uh, and we do because a lot of work. Because you said social capital was one of the issues. Right. Uh, and we do a lot of work to make sure that they're back uh, we reintegrate them back into society so the community uh, owns these households and says we will take care of these people and they're part of us. Now where does savings come into this? Savings comes in very early actually because uh, once the asset has been transferred and the stipend starts coming in we also ask families to start saving. Right. Of course we want to make sure that they're not saving their stipend uh, because the stipend is, is, is for given food for food consumption. Yeah. So we want to make sure that they're using that uh, using the stipend for that. 
with the savings, our main intention is not how much they save, but how regularly they can save. Right. And what we find is even when uh, the ultra poor households um, graduate out of ultra poverty and come into the microfinance space, a lot of them don't borrow immediately or, or at all, but majority of them continue to save right. very well. Uh, and our ultra poor graduate microfinance members have a much better savings regularity than our normal microfinance uh, members. Uh, Hashmi, the, um, this program has spurred a lot of interest and in CGAP then worked with Ford Foundation on replicating it in other countries. So what, what's been the result of those replications? And I was really thrilled and excited and uh, went literally around the world hitting every major donor agency in every major capital city in um, West, Western Europe, um, Washington, D.C., um, uh, uh, Ottawa, right. uh, Inter-American Development Bank, African Development Bank, telling them what exciting work BRAC was doing with the poorest. And the one response that I received from everywhere, that yeah, it's Bangladesh and it's BRAC, that's why it happens, right. can't happen right. anywhere. So I went back to CGAP and uh, to the Ford Foundation, which also was interested in working with the poorest. And I said, you know, this is the answer I'm getting. So we need to prove that it works. And so we came up with a little bit of money and we said, let's test it out. And we pilot tested the ultra poor model. We called it the graduation model in eight countries, 10 sites, starting with Haiti, which is like the worst conditions one could ever imagine, right, right. testing something out, to Honduras and Peru in this hemisphere, uh, three sites in India, in Pakistan, in Yemen, Ethiopia, Ghana. We really needed hard evidence. So we brought in the best impact assessment people, MIT Poverty Action Lab, Yale University with the um, IPA and Dean Carlin, New York University with Jonathan Murdoch, and said, look, you need to evaluate whether this works or not, because we need hard evidence. And so what we did, which was something very new in our world of microfinance, very old in the world of health, is we did randomized controlled trials that could establish not merely that people's lives had changed, but that change came because and solely because of the program. And we started finding out great successes. Uh, not everywhere, I mean, of course, there were some pitfalls, some problems. Uh, Yemen, for example, uh, we ended up in the middle of a civil war, you know, so right, things right. didn't work out. But the evidence showed that it succeeded. So that's when we went on to the next stage of this, taking it out to the world. Now, one of the groups, um and taking it out to the world that has shown interest in this uh, is not, doesn't come from the financial community, but comes from the flip side, the, the group that's already paying for, for people living in extreme poverty is governments who have safety net programs or welfare programs that are supporting them. So what has been your interaction with, with governments and these programs, how, how are they looking at uh, the graduation program? I think we recognize early on that we needed to scale up. It wasn't enough to have nice boutique little NGO MFIs doing something really good. And that's always been the mission, the mantra of BRAC, that you have to scale up. It's gotta be massively scaled up. And we realized that in most countries, it would be the government, would be the only group large enough with deep pockets to be scaling this up. Plus also, that made sense because it is a government's mandate to take care of the poor. And in many cases, governments do do that with uh, safety net programs and social protection programs. So we started involving the government from early on, and that's difficult. We have seen interest in Indonesia. The Ethiopian government, which is the most exciting, in its new phase of social protection with 10 million households, 30%, 3 million households will be following a very similar model to BRAC's ultra poor wow. program. Wow. Uh, the, the, the city of Rio, Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, they've taken this on. Colombia is taking this on, and you heard more about that. The government of Afghanistan is doing this 
it, like full speed ahead. Um, other countries are in interested, Tanzania, Ghana, South Africa. So I think we've turned that corner. We're making governments realize that as part of an integrated social protection policy that provides universal health care, education, stipends to certain destitute groups, that they need to take this on as part of that strategy. And honestly, I'm extremely optimistic about that, and I think we're going to see much more of this. And what is BRAC doing now to encourage uh, these groups? Once they get interested, what can they do to learn more about the ultra right, So we're uh, in the process of developing material um, from, from people who want to come and look at the way that we've done it. But of, of course, keeping in mind that not everywhere will it work exactly the way we've done it, so it needs to be contextualized and adapted for different, mm -hmm. um, for different places. Um, we're also um, holding uh, some national level workshops in different countries. So we're just looking at sharing our experience, uh, potentially providing technical assistance where possible. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, that has to be done uh, in a very careful way because we want to make sure that we're not just trying to do what we did in Bangladesh and right. other countries, right. that we have the ability and the capacity to be able to go to a place and be able to adapt that yeah. uh, for that context. And, and as you look at bringing these to scale, serving the millions of people that government have on the social protection roles, how does that change the way you look at the program? Or do, do, does it make you think differently about what you provide and how you provide it? Through the MDGs, we've been able to reduce extreme poverty by 50%. So the World Bank has a commitment by 2030, eradicating extreme poverty. Microgrid Summit is interested in that. The one thing I'd like to keep on hammering is that there are multiple pathways through yeah. which this is going to be taking yeah. place. And there are multiple entry points. So it's going to be everything from macroeconomic policies down to household level immunization programs. And what we each have to do is recognize what our entry points are. I think in the past, especially in our microfinance world, um, in, 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 in our sector, we've been rather divisive, um, engaged right. in a lot of name calling. You know, right. You're not the true right. microfinance people, right. you don't do this. I think there's a space for everyone, from commercial microfinance to somebody working in Wall Street. So the macroeconomist, by promoting great fiscal policies, by ensuring uh, macroeconomic stability, yeah. ensures economies moving forward. The physician working in public health ensures that everyone does get immunized. So there are going to be multiple pathways we need to recognize, we need to appreciate that, and we need to welcome that. And within that, the part that BRAC through the ultra poor program is playing, where I also fit in, is suggesting this alternative, suggesting a model that has been proven in the most rigorous assessments to have work, and we're asking policymakers if they're really serious about their commitments to integrate that as part of the global policy.